Okay, hello. So, so glad to get to interview you today. It's uh, 2021 and here we are in the spring working our way through the year, the new year. And I was so happy to discover your work and you, the movies you've made and just the advocate that you've become for incest survivors and trauma survivors in general, sexual abuse survivors in general. So just wanna honor you and thank you for the work that you're doing in the world. So deeply needed, yeah. So I'd like to start with just asking you a little bit about your just biographical, like where you grew up and where did you find joy in your childhood? I was born in Seattle, Washington, and I, um, for thir from age 15 to age 45, I lived away from the Pacific Northwest and I'm really glad to be back in the Pacific Northwest. So I live in Bellingham, Washington, which is north of Seattle. I, um, and I love the climate here. I love that we have so many trees. I grew up in uh, the country um, until I was six and then moved into a sub suburban area. And I, I just love all the trees where I live now there's trails, I can walk to a trail that's just a block away. And we have this unusual neighborhood where we have lots and lots of deer. It's like the deer cohabitate with the people so easily. Um, and they're, they're the least afraid of people I've ever seen. Um, so um, they just walk on the trail. And I guess that's why there's so many around here. Um, a few neighbors feed them, but they're just real friendly. So um, I have a really nice life now. My husband and I here, a house I like and a good life. I grew up, um, uh, my sister and I would play out in the woods and um, we, uh, another good thing from my childhood is I would walk to a neighbor's house and eat breakfast. So after she started, my sister was two years older. Um, it was after she started school and I would just walk down there alone and that neighbor would make me um, salty oatmeal that she cooked overnight on her wood burning stove. Uh, and um, I still like, I still like salty oatmeal and she'd cook homemade bread. Her, she lived in this little bitty house and it had just all smelled like homemade bread and, and oatmeal. Uh, she was very nurturing to me. Yeah, so it sounds like it was comforting and nurturing and uh, most survivors of sexual abuse or incest uh, who recover well, from what I understand, have, or most of us have had some source of support, yes. some kind and sane person in our lives who yes. really made the difference. So I'm glad that you had that and really happy to hear your story. And yeah, so did you feel connected to something spiritual, some sense of source yes. of love or protection just innately? I remember when um, I was five or six, um, after some severe abuse, looking up at the sky and seeing this light. And um, it felt like God was just shining his or her love into me. Um, I just felt that real closeness with God at that age. Um, yeah, and that, that, that has helped me through life. I love that because also my experience age four or five, you know, really young was that the cloud beings would gather me into their kind of arms and rock me and hold me and so the sky like I, yeah. it's, it's interesting to me that we both you know we got this these blessings and this source of love and support from the heavens or the sky and to me it was beyond religion right it was, it was like a direct spiritual 
transmission. And it makes me think now of the movie, tell me the name, tell us the name of the movie with the two sisters that you did. Oh, um, Sister Mary's Angel. Yeah, because there's a, there's a scene in there where the sister who was abused is talking to a priest and where was God when I was being hurt? And the answer he gave her was so beautiful. It's like he was right with you and he was crying. I mean, I'm, meta I'm paraphrasing, but yeah. Yes. And that just, I've been walking with that on my daily yeah. walks around. And the, yeah, yeah. So, beautiful. Yeah, and I, I think each person has to come to that themselves. And um, how the priest answered it was that I can't know that for you, but I know for me, when my dad used to beat me up, um, God was there. Uh, holding my hand and crying and yeah that was that uh when I was a little girl I wanted to preach sermons but in the church I grew up with and uh women weren't allowed to do that but I'd always be thinking of these sermons I could preach all the time I was growing up and I um that was my sermon you know I I made that movie so I could so I could share that piece of it that sermon within it just wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah, good. So let's forward a little bit to how old were you when you went into recovery? I was 37 when I remembered my abuse. Mm -hmm. And I would say I had been getting, God had been getting me ready for that for some time. I had read books on codependency. I had, um, I'd always known that my maternal grandfather was an alcoholic. I read books on grandchildren of alcoholics. So I was able to see some of that within the family system before I was ready to um, be aware of the actual abuse. Um, and then when I was 37, my aunt uh, talked to my parents and told them she remembered being abused by grandparents and uh, they just discounted her and said we think she's crazy we'll never see her again but I met with my aunt she didn't tell me that I had been abused she told me I had witnessed abuse and I just knew what she was saying was true and I got counseling I was already in counseling I was in marriage counseling because my ex-husband and I had a lot of difficulties in our marriage and I kept going to that same counselor. Um, and my first memory didn't come in counseling, but it came, um, she asked me to journal just anything I remember about my childhood, no matter how benign. And while I was in the process of doing that, I um, was in my living room and I looked up at the wall across from me and I could see this image of, um, of a man's hand. And that was my first memory. And then I, I very quickly regained a lot of memories of abuse. Yeah. And, and how did that feel? Did you feel comfortable or was it disturbing or? It was extremely disturbing because I, um, I, it was really hard to think of my father as not being honorable. I mean, that one piece. And so, my own um, abuse is quite extreme, but I think anyone who was incested by a parent can relate to the fact that, I mean, a really hard part for me was just accepting that my father would be someone who would do that. Um, and um, I did confront him and he, he never ever uh, confessed. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that was really hard. And then the other hard piece was my children were supposed to go visit my parents that summer. And, um, I ended up, you know, I, I needed to find out quickly which relatives were involved so I could protect my kids. And it was really scary to not know who might abuse my children. And basically, I trusted people who were non-relatives more than 
I trusted relatives, which is a hard thing to come to, but I think a lot of incest survivors need to consider that relatives may be less likely to be safe around children than non-relatives. Yeah, well said, that's certainly true and has been true in my own life as a survivor. So coming out to the family was, didn't go well in terms of any kind of validation or support, uh, but you know, with other people, I got much more support to help heal. So I was I'm really curious. fortunate. That, I was really fortunate to get validation from cousins because at that point I had three cousins and an aunt with similar memories, all recovered memories. But I could call if I remembered something new. I could call a cousin and ask. Mm -hmm they were just very helpful to me. And so I'm really glad I was able to make my film so I could be helpful to other people because as your first remembering is so hard. Yeah, it's kind of surreal, right? Just your whole reality yeah. kind of cracks open and there's something yeah. more real. And at least for me, it felt horrible. And at the same time, it felt right. Like I knew it, it was so yeah. centering and grounding. It's an embodied sense of, huh, oh, I'm coming home to myself. Yeah. Yeah. I remember just a few months after just, yeah, I, I guess it was maybe three or four months after I started remembering, I looked in the mirror and I just, you could see that light in my eye. I mean, I looked in the mirror and it was like, I'm really here. And before I think it was just kind of the shell of me. Mm -hmm. and it was such a neat experience to go, I am here, you know? Um, so yeah, that embodiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it sounds like uh, unwinding the freeze response, you know, coming out of the dissociation that, you know, we have to do as survivors, as children, to, in order to survive. So, yes. So beautiful. And what triggered you into going into recovery? I mean, was there a precipitating event or? My aunt disclosing. Okay, yeah. So you talked to her and then that kind of woke that up in you. Yeah, yeah. I had been doing other things to, like I'd been starting to take care of myself better uh, as I, uh, with reading the codependency books, just simple things like if I was reading a book and I really wanted a drink of water, just go ahead and getting it for myself or putting a blanket on my legs or just whatever like that. Um, and I had started being in community theater plays and that I think I had tried not to be very visible for a lot of my life and you need to be visible in order to act. So I think that was helpful and that was helpful in getting me in touch with emotions. So there were things that I did that were getting me ready prior to that too. Um, but I think uh, really, a lot of it was the age of my sons because some of the really, um, I remembered when my older son was eight and I was nine when my sister died. And uh, I, uh, that I tell in my film about that horrible abuse that happened at that time. So that was my worst memory. And I remember just shortly before my son was that age, which I think is very common for incest survivors. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. And so then did you start with a therapist right away or look for someone or you were able to work with the one you were already working with? Or? I worked with the one I was already working with and she was really good. Um, I had hypnosis, she did hypnosis and it, I'm glad I kept the hypnosis tapes. I taped them just to be sure she wasn't leading me and believing something that I didn't really believe. and. She was such a good psychologist as, as I've transcribed those, I'm just so impressed with her. Um, so uh, that helped, I had five hypnosis sessions. And then after that, I just was remembering so readily that uh, I didn't do that anymore. Although I have had EMDR um, and that's been helpful. I think part of what was helpful about my first, about some of my first, not my very first memory, but some of my first memories coming 
in the hypnosis session is then I was just there with someone who could help me calm down afterwards, who could just be really nurturing as I was remembering things. And her nurturing really comes out um, in, in the transcripts. Um, so, um, so that was a good experience for me. And what, I mean, you're, what as you're, good as it could have been. Yeah. As good as something so difficult yes. and disorienting can be. So, because it is surreal. It is. Place, right? There's a whole reality that we've suppressed because it's yeah. just been too overwhelming, too traumatic. And as children, we don't have any power to do much about it. Oh, yeah. Except that, you know, survive. So, yeah. Good job. Glad that you've glad that you've done this journey and can help so many other people now. You're good. So yeah. So hmm, was body work ever a part of your healing? It still is. Yeah. I go, I get craniosacral tomorrow, and I'm really glad. Um I my health is so much better than it used to be. I used to have fibromyalgia and I don't anymore, but I do still have um, pain, some that like I have TMJ that, that comes and goes. Um, and I've had, that has acted up recently and the cranial sacral seems to be really helpful with that. Um, mm -hmm. This therapist even does intraoral work. So she puts gloves on and she can go inside my mouth. Um, so body work has been huge and I plan to always get body work at least twice a month, no matter how good my health gets. Um, so I have huge respect for body workers. I've gotten various kinds. I've gotten, um, Reiki, um, Thai massage. I like, um, you know, regular Swedish massage. Um, I don't, I don't get the real deep massage. I get basically medium pressure, but massage is just a good part of my life. It's so good too. I was a cranial sacral therapist for 10 years. Really? Uh, yeah, I trained at the Upledger Institute and sounds like, you know, I did inter, worked in South Oh, you did, well. huh? So I'm very familiar oh. with it. Uh -huh. And there's a whole body of that work called somato emotional release. Uh-huh. Really helping to release emotions that are associated with the parts of the body or what's being held there uh -huh. but my passion was always that part of it uh -huh. <laughs> the emotional part and helping uh helping people release that so uh -huh. i'm thrilled that cranial work is such an important part of your life it's it's really really good work and always you know it's about finding a practitioner that's a match for you it is. Well, you so. need to find the right match yeah, yeah. so then has your recovery then been kind of a smooth journey or have there been fits and starts or ups and downs or? There have been other things going on in my life that really affected it. So I remembered in 1993, when I was 37, I divorced my husband, my the father of my children in 2003, which was a huge event in my life. Um, and I was really, um, I was really, you know, I, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want my children to, um, be affected by divorce, but I could see they were being affected by how I was being treated in my marriage. And I knew I needed to do it. I, I actually have, I actually made a film about my first marriage and it's, it's on my website under verbal abuse. And it's a 15 minute film that it tells about that the cycle can break, that my sons are not like their father was. Um, but yeah, I, I've more intently been in my recovery my ex-husband, um, at times he would say he believed me, at times he would say he did not believe me. And um, I remember one of the things he said was that all my all your friends are incest survivors. So then when we moved uh, up here to the Pacific Northwest, I made a point not you know to let him choose our couple friends, which even as I say that is so disempowered, I should never have done that. 
but um, I just really wanted my marriage to work. And it was really kind of funny because the first couple friends he chose, um, then um, she told me about her abuse as a child, you know, the first time we were together. So, um, uh, so yeah, I, I think I, the last two years of my marriage, I really was trying to stay married more than I was trying to do what God wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, and when I, um, faced that, then I left the marriage. Um, and there were times it was easier financially to do recovery work. And actually during my first marriage was a time that we had really good insurance. So it covered therapy well, and I was able to get the body work. I was able to get a lot of work done. Um, and, um, and my ex-husband to his credit didn't, didn't complain about the money spent on that as long as, you know, it didn't involve him too much. Um, so I did get massages at the end of the marriage. And then I continue, I, after I left the marriage and my finances were um, difficult, I still put a high priority on recovery work. Um, not as much, but I, I budgeted myself $150 a month. And with that, I could pay, I usually would get um, a monthly membership at yoga which helped me a lot. I'd go tons of yoga. And then that would allow me maybe one massage a month. Um, and I don't really know how, I, yeah, I guess I did if I went to somewhere with a discount. So anyway, I, I continued to put some priority on that. I still had insurance too. I still had health insurance. Um, so um, when I married my husband in uh, 2010, that was a really good thing in my recovery that I had someone, for the first time ever, I had someone who was there to support me. Um, and I remember our first Christmas, my husband is Jewish. So we, we uh, and my sons came, um, my sons were with their father on that Christmas day. So um, my husband and I went out to this really nice dinner in, uh, we lived in Portland at the time. It was at Timberline Lodge in the mountains, ski area. And uh, we had this wonderful meal. The people around us were on happy, you know, holiday times are good. And they were sitting in their family groups. But instead of being lonely about not being in, not having more people in my family, I just was so aware that this was a complete family, me and my husband. And I saw the snow falling and it just healed a lot of my missing family through the years. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. Like being really present to what is here for you now. Yes. And yeah. say so that's also a key, right? To remember to orient in the present. Yes. And feel and see and notice the blessings and the gifts. Beautiful. So good. So you did mention using EMDR. That was going to be one of my questions. And I wondered if also if you ever used EFT tapping or neurofeedback therapy. I did brain spotting. Mm. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Big, so it's, it's along it's, those lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's, I mean, it's just interesting that these days there's so much more available to us. Right. And you started recovery when? 91, 92? Is that what you were saying? Or? Um, I remember my views in 93. Yeah. So there was that wave in the early 90s. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it really was the Me Too movement of the early 90s, uh, mm -hmm. of the late 80s and early 90s. And then because people started because the false memory syndrome foundation, you know, was founded then, um, and they really courted reporters. So their reporters would say that memories like mine are false. Then that was difficult for survivors, but there were a lot of people speaking out in the early nineties. And, and uh, I think um, a lot of us, 
had difficulty speaking out. And I didn't go public during the 90s. I was doing divorce custody evaluations and I knew that if I did, um, I would be questioned about it on the witness stand. And I thought it might make my client less likely to be, um, uh, well, I consider my client the child. I was appointed by the court and both parents paid equally my fee. Um, but I would recommend one parent or the other. Um, and I thought the opposing counsel, you know, for the parent I was not recommending would use my childhood against me. And it would, then my recommendation wouldn't stand. Um, so I was not public. Um, and it's so nice and freeing to be able to be public now. Yeah, so it sounds like you're a social worker. Yeah, I was a clinical social worker, master's in social work. Yeah, so you like, could really begin to go public when you retired from that. Right, right. Yeah, great. Yeah, you can step into what feels right to you and not have yes. to be encumbered by those kinds of limitations. And I'd say that the book, The Courage to Heal was groundbreaking. Yes. Right, and so there was a groundswell of especially women, but also some men coming out about incest mm -hmm. at that time. And False Memory Syndrome Foundation was a reaction to that to try to shut it down, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, the parents so, didn't want to be sued. Yeah, really or hard. exposed or, you know, have or to exposed. deal with any of that. You know, it's it was, a, so you did a great job in your movie. So <laughs> about that. Thank you. But, Am I crazy movie? So we'll get to that in another interview, more detail. So I wanted to ask if you had flashbacks at times and what helped you navigate that territory, like the inner landscape of trauma, and if you still have them occasionally or I do still have them sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um I um, but they don't bother me nearly as much as they used to. Um, I was able to, I was able to handle them internally, um, and not let it show on the outside. I've never like completely fallen apart when I was somewhere where I couldn't completely fall apart. I've always been able to get myself home and, and let that be when, um, I, even when I was first remembering things, I would get my kids off from school to school and then I would come back and do just some quiet time um, so that that wouldn't be happening uh, so that I could, I put a very high priority on being a good mom. Um, and, um, but there was one time that I had a flashback and I was in the courthouse, you know, um, about to testify and I was still able to testify. Mm -hmm. So I, I functioned really high and, you know, I think some of us do and some of us, you, you just can't do that. And I, I'm not, if I had, if I had been married to someone else and didn't feel, uh, cause in my marriage, I would be belittled because I didn't earn as much as him. And I felt a need to earn money. Um, if I'd been in a different situation, I think I would have let my, I would have been able to let down more, but I, I couldn't, you know, I had to be, um, yeah, I had a lot of pressure to stay, part of staying married when my kids were uh, minors was that I really knew that my parents would give my ex-husband money to fight me for custody. Mm -hmm. And um, I just needed to be with my kids. Um, I didn't, my parents wanted access to my children and that was just not gonna happen. Um, and so I wasn't able to relax. Even as I'm saying that, I'm like, oh, how sad that was for me, you know, to be going through all this and not be able to relax, but now I can and I, I'm really thankful for the lifestyle I now have. Um, I, one thing um, I, 
um, I'm able to just, if I'm starting to remember something, something I did the last two nights was I, I told my husband I want to sleep in separate beds because I could feel that there was a memory coming and um, I thought that would be better for me. Um, and and um, so, you know, I, I, I'm in a situation that can accommodate my needs. Um, and I'm in a, I, I do, I exercise a lot, which I think really helps. I, uh, during pandemic, I've been walking 10 to 20 miles a week, um, walking, hiking, um, and doing yoga, um, oh, if not every day, every other day. So those are things that help me stay at a calm place. Um, and so if a memory needs to come, it can. That's beautiful. And I just honor you and commend you for the good work that you've done and the inspiration you can be for so many people. And incest survivors in general, I think one of our superpowers is being able to compartmentalize when we need to. Oh, yeah. You, you had a strong knowing of how to survive and how to navigate through that sticky situation where uh, keeping custody of your children, not only better for you, obviously better for your children. Oh, yeah. You know, it was more important than speaking out publicly, for sure. For sure. And it is a strain in some ways. But, mm -hmm. but then again, it's also a a strategic decision based on the need to survive and do the best thing for your kids and yourself. So, yeah, it just, I'm so blown away and impressed by the resilience of survivors who do the healing journey. Mm -hmm. It's uh, just amazing. So, yeah. Can, can we talk a little bit about ritual abuse? Not necessarily specifics of your experience because that's in the, the film, but just the distinction that I understood you to make was it's a when more than one, I wasn't gonna use, I use the word perpetrator present right. at the time. Does it also require a, a ritualistic quality or a kind of a maybe false, pseudo-religious or spiritual enactment of some sort or? I, I, different people define it different ways. And so since I made the film, I had to figure out a definition that that is what I use. And that is that there is either, either there's more than one perpetrator or there's more than one child victim. And just that, in my mind, makes it ritualistic abuse. Yeah. If, if uh, multiple adults abuse one, abuse one or more children at the same time. Um, and, and then you have aspects like you're having to witness the abuse, or either you have multiple perpetrators or you have to witness the abuse of another child or both. Um, the, another thing that is common in ritualistic abuse is use of a sacred object, mm -hmm. which um, happened with, with in some of mine. What I get away from, and one reason that ritual abuse, they, they dis, that it's discounted by some people, is they say, well, um, I've heard the definition of ritual abuse, it's only if the perpetrator does it for religious or spiritual reasons. Well, and that that they're not otherwise a pedophile. Well, that, you know, if a, by definition, if an adult uh, has sexual contact with a child, that makes the adult a pedophile. So, and the problem with that also is that you have to get in the head of the perpetrator in order to define what happened. And so I completely stay away from that. I don't know whether my parents were worshiping Satan. I don't know whether my other perpetrators were worshiping Satan. Uh, I don't know if they thought they were worshiping God. I don't know what they thought. And I don't need to know. I know what happened to me. I tell what happened to me. And, um, and I'm glad to be able to do that because ritual abuse 
of ritual abuse is so discounted. And if you experienced it, it's horrific. And then if you have to go through being discounted as an adult, it's horrific again. So I just, I just tell what happened to me and I tell, um, uh, and, and I know it was ritualistic abuse. Yeah. I yeah and, and really in a sense, all abuse affects us spiritually as well. You can't it does, separate absolutely. that. Yeah. And I feel like that was so wise of you to not try to get inside their heads. That's a boundary. That's yeah. self-preservation because also survivors tend to develop some pretty uh, superpower as empaths too, you know? So, yeah. and so uh, it's, it's quite a, it's a journey for survivors to learn boundaries too. Yes. You know, cause in those realms of kind of dissociated realms, you're in a kind of boundaryless space, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, I just, that's so brilliant. The way you decided to handle it, it just seems really healthy and grounded and the kindest way to be to yourself. I mm -hmm. feel like survivors really need to learn to be kind to ourselves. Oh, yes. And that needs to be like, it's almost my number one practice along with exercise and body work and, yes. you know, other things. Yes. So, yeah, so great. So just, you've talked a little bit about this, but I'm wondering about, it's like breaking ties with the family of origin can be traumatic just because the whole culture tells us that you know, these are the people who will take you in when you, everything has gone wrong, or, you know, these are your people. It's in a, and the whole culture just is structured around that. So it can be challenging to have to navigate that loss and it's a complicated loss because they're still they're still living and you know you're grieving and you want to see them or you do, and you don't want to see them i mean there's a part that just wants things to be different than they are maybe and that's not going to happen so how did you navigate that kind of complex territory there's a lot of subtleties to it and it's probably different for everyone but i imagine there's some common themes well that is one thing i like about my film is that i i go through my process with my father on camera and it was after his death but um, my process with my father i mean it even changed while i was filming to a, where i went back to the grave a second time um, my process with my mother um, eventually I'm going, I've um, started, I'm working on and will eventually make public um, Mothers and Molestation, a film about child abuse. So another documentary. And actually if survivors who are listening to this want to see some parts of it, I'm, I'm not ready to put out the whole film, but if someone who hears this wants to see some parts of it, I'm, I, I'll make that available. I, um, and that goes through the process with my mother. I mean, after I finished Am I Crazy? My journey to determine if my memories are true and documented, you know, my process with my father, there was still something going on with my mother that I hadn't gotten to the right place yet. And now I am. And um, basically with my mother, I'm choosing to see myself as my own mother. I'm so good at mothering. It works for me. I'm, I, it just, that, that is my ending with my mother is she really wasn't, and I am, I, I am my mother. Um, and that feels right. Now, both my parents, uh, my mother died in the late nineties and my father died 10 years later. So um, this is after their death. I worked through some things um, and I actually wrote a short story about um, my mother. I started having angel experiences with her seven years after her death. And I wrote a short story related to that. Um, but yeah, it's very complex to go through is, uh, and it, it took a lot of time. And 
One thing I would like to say related to that is it's okay to be angry. I could never have gotten to the place I am now without being angry at my mother, without being angry at my father. I could never have done that. I totally agree with you. Like anger is a cry for justice. Yes. And it's, it's, it's so necessary as part of our healing. And there, we get a lot of messages from the culture. Don't be angry. You know, so it's, it's fuel. There's so much energy. When we have suppressed anger, it wears us out. It takes a lot yes. of energy to suppress that powerful energy. So when you begin to see it as a way of loving yourself and saying yes to this part of you that's been hurt, it's very powerful to do that. So mm -hmm. yeah, great, great job. And I, yeah, I relate to that too. With I had an incredible experience sitting with my dad as he was dying. Oh. really released a lot so or I think you said in your film that both of your parents were incest survivors or did you say um, that um yeah my my father experienced ritualistic abuse um according to my aunt and my father told me he was um sexually abused by a female babysitter um, and then uh, also by male, um, it wasn't actually Cubs, it wasn't actually Boy Scouts, but an organization like that. Mm -hmm. um, and my mother, um, I go into that more, uh, but I do know for sure that my mother was incested by her father. So how beautiful and significant that you stop that pattern. Yes. I'm passionate about epigenetic traits and yes. being able to bring those inherited emotional, mental issues, traumas, you know, that, that we can bring them to a conclusion in the lineage because who knows how many generations that goes back. My my aunt thinks, um, well, her grandparents would be my great grandparents, but she's indicated it went back one generation, at least one generation before that. So that would be my great, great grandparents. Yeah, we won't know. You're not going to find that information probably on Ancestry.com or in the family, uh, you know, box of mementos, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Let's see. Yeah. So just, you seem just so empowered and so comfortable in your own skin. And I really, really love that. And it's wonderful to be with you. And do you feel like speaking out has helped you gain your sovereignty and your yes. autonomy? Yeah, it has. I, I, for people listening, I mean, I needed, I needed to speak out at the right time doing that too early. Um, would not have been helpful to me. Um, but my film was actually, you know, it helped me a lot. I, I healed physically while making the film. I, um, I just quit being afraid, you know, so much of my life I'd been afraid and um, I'm not afraid of my father. I'm not angry at my father. Um, I actually just don't think about him. I mean, he's, yeah, uh, and so that that all that was while I was making the film. Um, yeah, it's. Um, I remember you mentioned that in the film, like mm -hmm. it came. You had less pain. Yeah, it actually helped your health. It's just yeah, really really beautiful. So yeah, so would you like to tell us about the creative projects you're working on now? You mentioned that a little bit, but I'd love to hear. Yeah. About that so I love for people to go on my website um, on my website I have a list of how I healed um, I and I mentioned the film about my first marriage I um, it's under verbal abuse um, I, and then of course Nancy mentioned my fun film which is a PG-13 um, romantic comedy um, I'm working on an S. Uh, uh, I'm working on my memoir, which is going to be a collection of essays and short stories. I just finished one yesterday on religion, so it's it's going to cover uh, different um, 
different aspects of my life. Um, I do have an essay on my website and is connected with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so it's a really, um, it's very triggering. So it just be careful with yourself as you're looking at things. But yeah, I plan for my memoir I should come out in about a year. Yeah, so I think it's always a good thing for anybody reading traumatic material to pace ourselves, kind of like what you talked about earlier, where you would take your kids to school and then come home and really take some time to rest and calm down. And that's that arc of the nervous system. It's actually a brilliant neurobiological approach, you know, beyond the psychological aspects of the trauma that we've just got the rewiring to do. And that will take care of a lot of the psychological stuff too. Just when you can come into that rest and digest stage, then you're literally rewiring your nervous system, the neural circuits in your brain. So it's one of the challenges for survivors is to wire new circuitry because the brain gets into habitual patterns. Anyway, so yeah, good job. It's just been an honor to talk with you and to, I learned so much and I admire you and I'm grateful to you. And let's tell people what your website address is. Yes, it's www.maryknightproductions.com. And my last name is spelled K-N-I-G-H-T. So it's www.maryknightproductions.com. Mary Knight Productions. And if people go on your website, is there a way they can contact you or email you through your website? Yeah, my email is on my website, but I'll also tell my email address is maryknighthappy at yahoo.com. And just remember that's a night with a K, maryknighthappy at yahoo.com. I love that you're happy your in your email address. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. It's been really wonderful. So thank you. Yeah, can't wait to post this and share it. People are gonna love it and benefit thank you. And feel free to post my website and my email.